Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. Joining me today, two of my favorite guests. Well, they're actually regulars. Mr. Michael Becker, how are you? Hey, hey Paul, doing well. How are you? And of course, James, the professor, Ang. James, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me, Paul. So uh, we're, we're going to get, get in depth with one of our guests here in uh, just a short order. But I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about something that, that we're starting to bang the table on, and it is the DFW Apartment Investors Group, DFW Apartment Investors Group. They are going to do a field trip coming up here in January, and Michael Becker is one of the, the founding members of the DFW Apartment Group, and we thought that uh, the DFW Apartment Group was really formed with brokers, the people that actually sell multifamily properties, attorneys that represent the real estate lenders like us, and then all the people that's surrounding. And then Michael and is going to probably talk and talk a little bit more about what's going on, truly what's going on in the multifamily investing side. So if you're new to multifamily investing, I, we encourage you to uh, go to the Old Capital, say, podcast and register for the field trip. Again, it's the DFW Apartment Investors Group. Again, it just gives you a general overview of what's going on. And so a lot of people, you know, whether they they read it in the newspaper or they listen to some, some say, podcasts, the craziest thing is that a lot of people just get a lot of their information from LinkedIn or from social media, and all that stuff looks good, and a lot of these people are just self-promoting themselves. We think we have maybe a better answer about what's going on in the marketplace itself, and, and you're going to hear from the, the people that are directly on the streets, and it, that's the, the you know, listing agents, the the attorneys that are involved with these transactions and again, the lenders and what's going on and then share some behind the scenes information about uh, what's, what's going on. I'm going to ask you guys, you both any feedback, Michael or James about that group. No, I'm just uh, looking forward to, uh, to do this. What sometime in January, right, Paul? Yeah, it's going to be January 17th and 18th and it's going to be a bus bus trip. It's good. They call it the field trip. They'll get everybody on the bus and they'll drive to class A properties, class B properties, class C properties, and just get a little behind the scenes about what, what's going on in the DFW, North Texas area. And uh, again, if you're you're thinking about getting into investing, we want you to come and get a, just a general overview of what's going on. This is for only limited partners. It's for investors in multifamily. This is not for deal sponsors. This is for just people that want to get an overview on the deal. So that kind of fits hand in glove to the person that we're, we're going to speak with today that we've known for a while. He's been with RealPage for a long period of time. He's the chief economist over RealPage and RealPage is a great source of great information about what's going on. That's just one piece. The technology side of what the company actually does is, is fascinating. And we'll talk with our guest today is, is Jay Parsons with RealPage. Jay, how are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me. No problem. All right, I'm going to kick it over to Michael and James, and it will start the 20 questions. Yeah, well, Jay, appreciate you coming on. And for those of uh, those of us listening that don't know who you are, maybe maybe give a quick a little background on yourself and uh, your role at RealPage. Sure. So um, I head up our team of economists and analysts here at RealPage, um, as well as our team of industry principals. And so, you know, great thing about I've kind of been at RealPage is I kind of liken it to um, how ADP has a lot of payroll information on private payrolls. You know, through RealPage, we see millions of units of uh, lease transactional information that flows through our software. And then, you know, data nerds like myself, you know, get a look at that data on an aggregate basis and try to see what's going on. So uh, so we try to track the market and and do our best to, to uh, forecast what might happen as well, although crystal ball is a little fuzzy these days. <laughs> well, I do, I do uh, follow Jay on Twitter. So what's what you, what's your Twitter handle? I think you give a lot of good information. So I'll do a shameless yep. plug there and then we'll get into it. Thank you. It's just at Jay Parsons, J A Y P A R S O N S on Twitter. And yep, also so on LinkedIn gives, as well. Yeah. Gives a bunch of great information. So I'd encourage people to follow Jay. 60,000 really followers on Jay. 
<laughs> yeah. So really what I think kind of main topic of the conversation is just kind of general state of the market. What do you what are you seeing out there? I mean, it's obviously been, you know, wild ride here the last uh three, four years going from you know, it seemed like we had a, a rate hiking regime into twenty eighteen and then they 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 paused and start cutting and 2019 and we had COVID and then they just threw a ton of money at it and everything went crazy and we got five years of rent growth in one year and uh and then now here we are it's kind of going the wrong way a little bit and values are, are probably off somewhere around 25 percent give or take across the nation from the peak of Q2 2022 what's kind of your general general take on the market today well yeah you nailed it pretty well I mean it's been a roller coaster and obviously I think the challenges are well known we'll get into that, you know, rates and supply, rents contracting a lot of markets. But I think, you know, let me just briefly say, I think part of what's also the story that gets less attention right now, it's still good demand. We're seeing good demand for apartments. And I think I think what we're seeing really is uh, some normalization in demand this year. It's not like 2021. You know, I think that period, as you kind of alluded to, it brought in a lot of investors who may not have a real sense of what normal really is in this space. So, uh, you know, the so overall demand fundamentals are very healthy, but in the short term, there's just a lot more supply. And that's why we're seeing the challenges that we are. And is that nationwide or is that Sunbelt or where, where, where are we seeing the supply? Is that everywhere? It's really everywhere. You know, I see a lot of stuff. It's like everybody talks about the Sunbelt, I mean, especially like the Wall Street guys. You know, they're, they've been anti-Sunbelt <laughs> since the Sunbelt was, 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 was burst. But um, <laughs> it's, it's really happening almost everywhere. It's, it's been happening on the West Coast. I say everywhere. I mean, there it's not as much in the the Midwest and some of the Northeast markets, but you know, even even in some of these spots, it's still more than what these cities typically see. So, you know, we saw really this last few years kind of a perfect storm of factors that's created, you know, between low rates, cap rate compression, uh, high demand, high rent growth. All of that kind of gave way to what I believe is a generational spike in apartment construction that uh, akin to what we saw in the 1970s. And I don't think we're going to see anything like this again, any time in our careers, most likely. So drilling down, what what, is, what are the kind of the conditions on the ground? So obviously you said uh, good demand, but but more supply, at least in the short run. What are you kind of seeing for, for rental rates? And is that, and how do you bifurcate that across, you know, the different property, you know, classes A, B, and C? Sure. Yeah, we're seeing, um, you know, rents have slowed down everywhere. I think what we're seeing in the Sunbelt and the West Coast is, most of these markets are now are now negative on rents, and it's not dramatically down, but we're seeing in, at the high end rent cuts in the five, six, seven percent range in places like Austin and Phoenix and Boise. But you know their, their rents are falling even in you know California and Seattle and uh, other spots that uh, you know historically are viewed as higher barrier to entry. In terms of the classes, you know this is the biggest surprise to me, and frankly, where we were wrong uh, going into the year is uh, our view was that most of the supply would impact just the class A space because of the high nature of these rents. I mean, today's new construction is expensive. Land's expensive, construction, materials, labor, obviously fees, everything's expensive. And so that creates these higher rents for these new properties. And so going into the year, the gap between lease up rents versus your typical, you know, stabilized class B rent was somewhere between 25, 27%. And what we've seen happen is those numbers have that range has contracted quite significantly, especially in these ultra high supply areas. And so we're seeing more move ups from B through, you know, concessions and uh, of lease up concessions and people who are, you know, paying a lower share of income on rent and can afford to pay more for that brand new property. Well, now you have more of that available. There's a concession or maybe you're still paying a little more than you were before, but it's now worth it to be in that brand new, well-located property. And so we're seeing a much bigger impact to be, in fact, you know, class B rents are down in most of these markets where there's a lot of supply. And I think next we're going to see a little more impact to C as we see move ups from C to a B. It's something that the researchers call the nerds, they call uh, filtering. And that that process is taking effect much faster than I would have anticipated this year. And how long do we foresee this going on? I mean, you know, my my view is, you know, kind of just observing it's been since, you know, really all year, all 2023, but really since March, when you had the Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic failures, yep. you know, it's been next to impossible to get a bank loan, right? So the, the debt that's out there is Fannie, Freddie, HUD, LifeCo, some of the debt funds, but the banks are larger, the, the construction lenders for for developers. So it seems like we've had little to no starts because it's hard to get capitalized with equity and it's next to impossible to get a, get a loan. 
So starts have to have fallen off dramatically, even though you you kind of read some of the the headlines from the government uh, different that the, the track the uh, the government agencies that track uh, starts. But to me, it seems like starts have to be you know ninety percent off or something since March because impossible to capitalize. And if a generic deal in Texas takes two years from breaking ground to final CO, I mean you know we fast forward 14, 15 months from today. There's got to be a giant hole of supply coming at us. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Absolutely. You know, forecasting is a tough business, but the easiest thing to forecast is supply because of the, you know, like you said, the time it takes to to get that project planned and started and completed. So, you know, we're going to peak on supply next year, and uh, some of that could get delayed into early 2025. But really, to your point, starts have dropped off and. You know the census, as you sort of alluded to, the the I like your little knock on the government data here. So they they're basically they're they're sampling a small they're doing a small survey of permit holders and say, calling them saying, hey, did you break ground your project? And they they make some extrapolations from there, versus what a private data collector like a real page or a co-star or somebody like that. You know we're trying to track every single project from plan to start to completion. And so in our data, and I know from some other data providers as well, is we're seeing starts that are down close to 50% this year. And even that is a little bit misleading because a lot of those were starts that were really planned and funded last year and got started, you know, first half of this year. So as we go further out, obviously you mentioned construction loans are less available, but the other really important factor here, and, and also and I got a few things. Another factor is obviously with rents contracting, that makes it harder for these deals to pencil out as well. Then the third factor that's really important is that as bank loans have gotten harder, to, that's, a, that's the primary vehicle for construction loans, as you mentioned, those are harder to access. When you do, you're also getting uh, typically a lower loan to cost ratio, having to cover that with more equity. But a lot of these traditional ground up development investors, they're now sort of on the sidelines because their strategy is now waiting up potential, waiting out potential lease up distress, not funding uh, ground up development. And so I think we're in a period here where we're just not going to see a lot of starts. And I just I don't see a way to get, even if rates drop a little bit, I mean, obviously a big drop, there's probably other problems, right, in the economy. So even if rates moderate a little bit, it's hard to see a scenario where starts can meaningfully accelerate prior to, say, second half of 2025, in my mind. And and so do we see rents being soft through 24 because of this? Or when do we see kind of the corner turned on, on rents kind of getting back to be positive and et cetera? Yeah, no, there's, there's been a direct relationship between, I mean, it's fact, it's just remarkably correlated. You know, the more supply we have, uh, the more that impacts rent. So again, that peaks next year. I think nationally rents remain pretty flat next year and, and still declining in a lot of markets. And then, you know, you get to 2025, I think, you know, assuming the economy is in decent shape, and obviously that's an assumption there. But, you know, it's just, I mean, this is pretty simple supply and demand stuff. And um, again, if the economy is in good shape, we're going to see more demand than we will supply. And I think what we'll start to see first in first half of 2025, going into summer, getting a leasing season, more concession burn off from all these lease ups that are finally leasing up. And that's going to drive up effective rents. And by end of 25, and certainly by 26, and likely in 27, we should see, I think, a good rebound in in rents. Uh, nothing like 2021 peak inflation period, but I think we're certainly going to, you know, apartment operators should be positioned for, for, um, for a rebound by that point. So second half of 25 through probably 27, we should see outsized rent growth of maybe double the double the average or something like that, historical average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if you think about like you know two and a half three percent as historical average, I think I think being in the mid single digit range is a is a reasonable forecast. Good. Okay. Cool. And then my final question before I kick it over, to James is, you know, I've been a little surprised. I mean, you have all these kind of inexperienced sponsors that uh, took on a lot of a lot of projects in 21, 22 with, uh, you know, floating rate, debt fund, short maturities, and uh, buying, you know, uh, older product in tougher locations for, you know, four caps or whatever they were doing at the time. I thought for sure by now we would see some some more distress. Do you have do you have a read on that? Because it feels like there's a stress in the market just hasn't come up to the surface yet. So a lot of a lot of dead bodies just haven't fallen, I guess. Do you have a read on that situation and what's kind of the house view real page on when do we see some of these deals kind of start clearing the market? Yeah, I mean that that's obviously the you know billion dollar question right now and uh, a multi billion dollar question. And it's not 
it's I mean like everybody else I, I i i've been a little surprised how long it's, it's played out i mean i i wrote a kind of a um synopsis coming out of the uh nmac annual meeting january february of this year and kind of i think at the time the industry consensus was by the second half of this year we should see a lot of that hit in the market and as you allude to it really hasn't and so going into next year you know i think at some point you know it has to and uh you know i just don't know how it's going to play out one thing that we're seeing different from previous cycles or certainly the gfc period is that lenders have been much more patient and generally flexible assuming they can be flexible and you know these debt funds you alluded to i mean some of them have more flexibility than others. Obviously, if you uh, have a type that doesn't allow uh, for flexibility, or those those deals are going to be challenged. Also, we're seeing the same thing with CMBS. In fact, every distressed deal that I've seen make headlines has been CMBS stuff so far. And so here's kind of my bottom line. I, I think what we're going to see is is the stuff that is you know your your well located class A you know, lease ups, uh, potential financial distress in these situations. I think there's going to be a lot of demand for those assets. You, you know, there's a lot of groups that want those type of deals, looking for good quality real estate where there's no physical distress, well located. But I think what's really got to have a little bit of a reckoning is where you have, you know, C, B minus stuff, heavy value ads bought by those less sophisticated groups you mentioned that were short term floating rate debt, expecting to see, you know, big trade outs on renovation. And, uh, those are bought at pretty low cap rates. And I think that's where you're going to have to see some cap rate expansion between the A's to those C's again, which that gap really narrowed, as you know. And so I, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of that kind of value of this next year, year and a half, two years is, um, you know, some some uh, returning spreads. It's going to you know lead to some, you know, resulting from some distress in those groups that, you know, just can't raise the capital to make these deals survive. Yeah. James? Yeah. Jake, can, I mean, we're we're pretty lazy focused on Texas, but maybe for people that listen to our podcast that are outside of Texas, uh, yeah. can you maybe hit just sort of the highlights sort of on a national basis? You know, I, I try to listen to some recalls and stuff like that. And they, you know, they mentioned some problems up in Atlanta, just with, you know, whether it's fraud or whether it's just the courts, maybe touch on some of the what you're seeing in, in these markets outside of Texas for us. Yeah, you know, Atlanta is interesting one. You know, as you mentioned, uh, there's a Atlanta is a hotbed for leasing fraud, and so I mean, just to give you give folks listening kind of a brief description, a lot of people don't. I, I I think this is probably one of the biggest topics that people just don't broadly understand outside the industry and how this actually impacts the broader rental market and renters. At the end of the day, is um, leasing fraud has gotten incredibly sophisticated, and a lot of times people think about it as Oh, these people just can't afford the rent. And so, you know, they're having to, you know, fudge a social security number or something in order to make this make this work or the income statement or something. But it's 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 a lot more sophisticated than that. I mean, people are paying hundreds or thousands of dollars for a very sophisticated package of um what's called a synthetic ID, which is, you know, real information that's basically stolen identities online, kind of parsed together into a complete package with th- even things like actual pay stubs that's been you know uh, forged and but would have a, a number that you could call and it'll verify the income in these cases they're not even not just you know fudging you know the numbers they're using fake names fake identities and so you don't even know who's leasing those apartments and so consequently consequently there's no real I mean, it's not like you should report them to the credit bureaus and ding their credit score because it's not them right and uh, so that creates a really complex issue where uh, if you let those folks in and then in Atlanta, too, the courts are so backed up because of this stuff. And, and in fairness, because of some traditional distress as well, that, you know, I heard a stat that there's two and a half, uh, two full time, one part time employees for Fulton County, which is Atlanta's main county, to process ev- eviction filings. And so uh, that's really backed up the system. Uh, last I heard, it was, you know, as much of a year wait to process that. So that's basically people essentially, you know, living rent free for a year who are not who they say they are. Um, on your property. And so that, that's been a real issue and it's leading to some pretty sophisticated ways to try to combat some of this fraud. Because, you know, ultimately, I guess this impacts renters as well. It means you have people who are, you know, really need to find safe and affordable housing who are not able to find something because those units are being occupied by uh, with, with a fraudulent lease and so or fraudulent application. So, and by the way, I'll just give you one more. I know I'm talking about this a bit, but it even gets crazier. We've seen some cases where people are fraudulently leasing it and then they sublease it <laughs> to somebody who has no idea what happened so they're paying the rent to somebody who has the lease the property manager is not getting paid they knock on the door and the the tenant says well no i've, I've been paying the rent 
Well, you know, then paying it to the fraudster, right? It's a it's really remarkable, uh, remarkable sophistication that we're seeing in this in this space, and it's happening in you know the auto industry and obviously retail, et cetera, as well. But uh, it's a real challenge, and especially in Atlanta, but I think we're seeing more across the country as well. I know I, I, I talk a lot about Atlanta there, but uh, that, that's <laughs> you, you hit on a hot topic. No, uh, this is why we brought you on because we don't see a lot of this stuff, and then I think the other market that we don't see a lot in, but love to hear about is Phoenix. What are you seeing in Phoenix? And and that seems to be besides the sort of Texas markets, which we'll get to. But what are you seeing in Phoenix? Yeah, no, I, th- I think Phoenix is, um, uh, you know, F- F- Phoenix is still more of a boom bust market. than I think the Phoenix backers believed it was, um, you know, the last 10 years. I mean, obviously, it took a big hit in the great financial crisis and it, it appeared to show some signs of stabilizing and, and then started to really outperform, obviously, in the early stages of you know, 2020, 2021, but it's, it's just cooled off dramatically. And, and, you know, I think part of it is, is uh, some, some normalizing migration patterns. You know, it's not, it's not booming like it was. It's, it's still a great market. Don't be wrong, but you know, it's, it does have some cyclicality to it. And then on top of that, it's building a lot of supply and that's just created a kind of a challenging formula for, for that market. So it's, it's cooled off quite significantly. I think rents last I checked, we're down five or 6%. Vacancy, I think, is 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 uh, in the upper single digits at this point. Um, I, mean, I don't have the number in front. I think it's seven or eight percent, which is among the highest in the country for major markets. So, you know, it, it's going to take it on the chin for a little bit here. Okay, so let's dive into the four metros here in Texas. You know, it's almost it's December almost, and uh, it's time for finals for people in school. So maybe give a grade to the four markets here in Texas for us. And why? Yeah, all right. You're the professor. So... I'm handing you the, the grade book. <laughs> Give a grade for the four metros and sort of how they're looking right now. So we're talking about short-term performance, not long-term outlook here then? However you want both. it. However yeah. you want. Yeah. Well, in the short term, nobody deserves an A. But, uh, okay. you know, I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, we'll start with Austin and go in alphabetical here. I mean, Austin, I, I remember having a debate a couple of years ago with someone making the case that, you know, Austin was the, was the best long-term market in Texas. And just reminding them, it's like, I think a lot, and obviously all of Texas, a lot of listeners to Texas, but people outside of Texas, especially investors, they don't realize how small Austin still is. I mean, Austin's an amazing city, but it's it's a single highway city for the most part. And I'm not counting that outer loop that's mostly desolate still, right? It's going to be more boom bust as a result of that. And so, no, the demand tailwinds are great. The city is still great. Uh, you know, it's it's not a knock on the market at all. But it's still a smaller market, and it's still more susceptible to to big boom bust swings. And I think that's what we're seeing now. It's one of, like that one in Phoenix are the two of the softest markets in the country in terms of rents right now. Significant rent cuts, and the challenge there, a lot of people don't realize also, is it's a very young market. Not just in terms of population, but in terms of the age of the apartment stock. Something like I think more than sixty percent of apartments in Austin have been built in the last thirty years, and so what that means is that there's a smaller spread between kind of your typical average older apartment property, your class B versus your brand new lease up. And so that means that it's much easier than most cities, even in compared to Dallas or Houston, to move from a class B property to a class A property. The rents really aren't that different. In fact, if you you kind of use broker language for these, like there'd be a lot more A's than B's in a market like Austin, just as a function of age. And so that means there's a lot more people, a lot more properties competing for the same renters. It's going to be a challenged market for a while, given the volume of construction that's still hitting that area. Um, there, is there a grade before you move to the okay, next market? I guess, I guess, I guess it's 2023 <laughs> grades going to have to be a D uh, for <laughs> yeah. short-term performance. Yeah. But long-term still fan, you know, you know, it, it's, it's an A market long-term, but uh, you gotta, be, you gotta be, it's, it's, you can't, you can't be a uh, time in this market, right? It's going to be good in the long run though. If you, if you're a long-term investor in Austin, you're taking on the chin now, but you more than made up for it past couple of years. Yeah. The the one highway thing for sure. I mean, I was driving out of Austin, I think on like a Sunday morning and going up I-35 still took an hour to get to Round Rock, right? Like, and this is Sunday out going the opposite way. It's not even, yeah. So, all right, keep going. So you got Austin, what's next? All right. So let's go, uh, let's go DFW. You know, I, I'll tell you, I would give Dallas probably a, a B, B, a B minus maybe, uh, depending on the sub market. But, uh, you know, Dallas is, you know, and I think also, too, is is Dallas is now viewed nationally as as kind of a tier one market, core market. You know, more and more investors are leery of the coastal markets. 
And so they're looking for places that have lesser political risk, but still are bigger and more stable than in Austin. And so, you know, places like, you know, Dallas, Denver, even Atlanta to some degree, I mean, they, these are the spots that, and Houston on the cusp of that, you know, these are the spots that that really, you know, give you more stability. What Dallas wasn't as hot as Austin a couple of years ago, but it's also, you know, we're seeing rents that are closer to flat there versus down 6% in Austin. And while there's a lot of supply, everyone talked about, you know, Dallas always leading the nation in construction. On a relative basis, Dallas is much smaller meaning like supply as a, as a percent of the existing supply. There's also a pretty wide spread between your average class B property versus your new construction. And uh, you also have a very diverse uh, economy in Dallas. And so all of that has, has created, I think, a little more of a of a cushion. Um, and so Dallas, um, you know, I, I, much more uh, bullish on, uh, well, uh, Dallas is a much more stable market. And so that, that's why you get more of a steady eddy, solid B performance there. We all live in Dallas, and so I guess we're partial to it. But like, <laughs> is there something that people are missing? Like, if if I've got eighty five percent of my investment dollars in Dallas, is there a risk that people are missing in Dallas? Like, do you see something there in this market? Because everyone loves it; it's the number one market for the last three years. It feels like on every chart in terms of yeah. investment dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, investment dollars. I mean, Dallas is the magnet. I think you're what you're going to see. The risk in Dallas is. It's it's not just because it's strong market doesn't mean you're immune to the the financing issues. I think what you're going to see is some real distress come out of Dallas, but it's going to be some of these smaller groups that going back to this you know short term floating rate debt, high value add story that bought in especially lower quality sub markets, expecting these you know big trade outs on renovation. You know you're going to see distress in Dallas, but I think what you know the national people outside the city have to kind of the market have to kind of realize is that it's not going to be supply demand distress. It's going to be financial distress from those who got above their skis, kind of kind of uh, over expecting Dallas just because it's Dallas to automatically be a golden ticket. Yeah. All right. Um, Houston. You know, Houston, I think, is 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 probably I mean, everybody always likes to know, say, like, you know, what are your top markets, bottom markets? I think Houston is a can be a sneaky outperforming market next year. And I would give it another kind of B performance this year like Dallas. But, you know, Dallas does have a lot more supply than Houston. You know, going back a few years, you know, we had the oil price crash, uh, you know, that I don't know if it remembers, but that was like mid to 2010s and uh, the Urban Lands Institute, ULI, given it the kiss of death, like the SI cover curse when um, it picked their members, picked Houston as a top market for that year. And then oil prices dropped off, you know, all these lease ups that that were great investments for the second owner. And coming out of that, you know, Houston just wasn't viewed as favorably, especially relative to other major Sunbelt markets. And so, as a result, like uh, this is, I think, a, a shocking stat for a lot of people. It's like Houston's actually building supply at a below average rate, not just for Texas, but nationally. Like Houston's building less supply on a size adjusted basis than the national averages. And at the same time, we continue to see it's uh, been a, obviously a continued magnet for you know jobs and demand and whatnot. So I, I think Houston's going to be pretty stable in the big picture. And so I, I I think it's kind of earned that that class B, and I think it's it's even outperforming Dallas by a little bit on rents right now. So yeah, I think it'll be a good market on a relative basis even next year as well. Does we haven't touched on this on this call, but like insurance in Houston, do you just yeah. I mean, what's any tips on that, or what what you're seeing across sort of in those coastal markets? Because yeah, no, you know, I, I, sh- I should have mentioned that's a good call. So you know that, that that's the big challenge in Houston is not so much supply; it's really the expense side with insurance. So uh, property insurance premiums, everybody know they're through the roof. You know, it's especially problematic in Florida, Southern California. I hear that a lot too, but in Texas, it's bad everywhere. But especially in in Houston, obviously the exposure to the coast, and particularly if you're in an area that's uh, you know, has flood risk uh, of any type, then then th- those costs have, you know, have gone through the roof. I think in some of these cases, we've seen insurance premiums that are 2x what they were a few years ago. And, you know, if whole carriers have left that market, don't want to work there anymore, that means there's fewer options, prices go up more. And uh, it's, it's you know, I don't, I, I don't, there's not even a lot of clarity when it'll settle down. So that that, that is the big risk for for Houston. And so, Obviously, if you have an investment that's that's not as exposed to or in an area of Houston or type of property that has a little more cushion from that, you're going to be better off. Does he, I, we have a very strict no Houston rule at my office? We uh, we own Austin, <laughs> Dallas, San Antonio, but we just don't do Houston. That is one of the main reasons. But uh, my perception is they also tend to have a little more 
bad debt delinquency, maybe not quite to Atlanta's extent. Is is that more of an issue in Houston than the other markets in Texas as well? Or am I mis, uh, misunderstanding kind of the, the Yeah, no, no, you're not. I think Houston, though, is a, Houston has a huge <laughs> chunk of like true class C, very challenged and economically challenged sub markets. And, and obviously, that's, you know, not really zoning in Houston either. And so there's certain corridors that, you know, I would just avoid, you know, because of issues like that. And you have a lot of, you know, kind of 70s, early 80s, vintage, uh, generic aging apartments with a more challenging economic base there as well. And so very dense pockets of older apartments that are that it would be challenging investments. But I do think there's area like, you know, particularly, you know, Everybody loves the woodlands and and um, in that area. I mean, there, and you know, there, there's there's definitely pockets where I think that can be very very solid. You probably tracked this to some extent, but I mean, every time my parents live in Houston, I grew up in Houston. But every time I go to Houston, it's freaking crowded and yeah. everything's jam packed. So a million, it seems like a million. As many people move into Dallas, there's as many move into Houston. And if the supply is a third of it, I mean, at some point, the you know those units will fill up. But at, yeah. at what cost, right? So I think I think some people get a little bit, you know, they look at a Class B deal here in Dallas, and they're like, "Well, it's one fifty a door." I go down to Houston, it's a hundred a door. Sign me up. But they don't dig into the numbers quite as tight, and there's a reason that you know maybe cap rate should be higher in Houston than a DFW like we like we graded it. All right, finish up. With yeah, well, and, and just real yeah. quick too, I think there's a reason too why Dallas is generally viewed more favorably on a national scale investors and that's some of those reasons um as well it's just been a more stable market long term by most measures okay let's hit san antonio real quick yeah so san antonio san, san antonio is kind of your steady eddy story for the most part you know i think one thing that's been a little bit interesting there is we're seeing it is, traditionally san antonio has been a very low uh, has a lower structural vacant a, a lower structural occupancy rate meaning like normal occupancy pre-covid in san antonio was typically like 92 percent ish, you know, which is pretty, you know, a little bit lower than we see most parts of the country. And and we've seen a pretty quick reversion back to that kind of range, you know, after seeing it bump up quite a bit. And some of that supply, but also I think, you know, San Antonio is is still a market that's pretty dependent on less high growth job sectors and more kind of steady, slower growth sectors. And you know, obviously the military being one, but you know, it's it's um it's a good solid market. It's not the home run market, uh, but it's also not the one where you're going to, you know, it's been a market that um, has been unspectacular in the sense of not, it's not as been as weak as, as Austin, but certainly didn't have the same upside uh, earlier on as well. So I give that one a probably a, a C plus I'd put it in between uh, DFW in Houston and then Austin on the low end. I appreciate you getting a great book out for us on the Texas markets. Uh, last yeah. last question uh, for me is really around, I mean, obviously you talk to a lot of owners. Is there anything that you see owners are doing? I know you you put out a lot of posts on different things that you see, but what would you, number one thing that owners should be doing in the fourth quarter of 2023? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I assume like operational asset management stuff, not, you know, for the most part, just running assets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, 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 maybe a two part answer. I think number one is is just being realistic. You know, I know that there's a lot of challenging conversations that owners and property managers are having with their investors. You know, there's a lot of investors, as I mentioned earlier, came into this space in the last few years without a real sense of what's normal. And so I've seen some cases where, in fact, I've been brought into some of these conversations to go to help the cause sometimes. And so example, it's like right now, you really got to focus on retention. Like there's a lot of, there's more turnover because renters have more options. You know, COVID, people weren't moving. Then, you know, you had this record low vacancy across Texas and most of the country. People didn't have options. And now renters have a lot more options again, thanks to all the supply. And so what I've noticed is that sometimes the uh, ownership groups and the, and the investment partners, they do not want to give on rents, especially on renewal rents. They want to hold the line. They want to get 3%. But, you know, now what you're doing is your renewal rents are potentially, in some cases, above market. And so I think the number one thing you could do is just being realistic about where rents are if you're in a situation like that. And also just being leery of not trying to ask your renters renewing their lease, who especially those who have been paying you're paying the rent and been good quality residents. You know, you got to, you don't know how long it's gonna take you to backfill that. And turn costs are up more than 2x since COVID. That unit's gonna sit vacant longer too. And you lease it to somebody else after taking that vacancy loss and those turn costs and the marketing costs associated with it. 
you're probably going to get a lesser rent. I say probably in, in these cases, obviously it's always, every property is different, but in a lot of cases you may end up taking on a lesser rent than just renewing that previous renter at a flat rent, or even, you know, offering them a $500 gift card to renew at a flat rent or something like that. So I would be realistic and prioritize retention right now. Did you have a second thing? You said two things. Well, that was it. It was like the be realistic and then the retention, like focus retention. on retention. Heads Got it. Is. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll turn it back to Paul. And I don't know if Mark Twain was a value added apartment investor, <laughs> but the reports of my death, the value added apartment investor, have they been greatly exaggerated? Are you, uh, I mean, we divided it up into maybe two different categories, three different categories the stabilized properties. On one side, we have the value-added properties on the far other side, and maybe a kind of a hybrid of value-added and stabilized. But for the last you know, 10 years or so in the syndication model, we've seen a lot of, of apartment uh, syndicators go into the value-add space. Yeah. Uh, and so what what's your take right now? Are you seeing uh, value-add investors come into this market? Yeah, no, I, I agree. It is, the, the death has been greatly exaggerated. Um, again, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, how these deals were financed more than anything else. I mean, I think a lot of times people forget too, like always the headlines always about rents, but most, um, most investors on a typical deal structure can absorb a year or two of flattish rents and uh, on the new lease side, right? And you can still even see in those, some cases your rental revenues you know, still positive, even if there's a little bit of uh, new lease rent cuts. And so that's not the biggest challenge. And so as it relates to like, you know, these value add investments, I mean, there's still going to be a need for a long term. You got, you know, you got uh, some, you know, you, you, the, the, those you got properties that 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 are right for value add. There's been a lot of it these last decade. There's still going to be the case. But uh, the, I guess the point I make on that, though, is that I think for right now, it's just you know, it's number one, it's, 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 you know, making sure those, those, those deals can still pencil out. But I think you're going to see more as that distress kind of re some of that finally hits the market. A lot of these are going to be projects that never got around to doing the value add they pro forma. And so there could be some meat on the bone there. And if you wait out kind of the right pricing for that stuff. And then I think from there too, it's just as, as we've seen, you know, good discipline value add players, they're renovating up to realistic rent. It's like, you just can't go up to brand new lease up rent levels, right? You want to maintain that buffer that keeps you out of, of you know, one or two months concession uh, striking range with a nearby lease up if that's what you're uh, if those are in your area. So so, again, short term, it's challenging, especially with you know cost of debt and whatnot. But, you know, long term, there's still going to be opportunity there. So, so one, one thing that's uh, I, I see you talk about. Sorry to cut you off there, Paul, but uh, yeah. is, is you, you know, talk about the CPI and print on inflation and how you know big big chunk of the the CPI that we see includes you know housing and how that's a flawed measure and it's backward looking you see that on CNBC all the time so everything you're saying is i can't remember exactly what the the housing component was but i think it was like a positive 4% or something last CPI print when you know on the ground we're basically zero you know and and negative in a couple in several markets when do we see that kind of t- rolling over? Like, when do we see CPI print below two percent, largely due to housing? In your in your opinion? Well, it, I mean, first of all, let me say I'm not a monetary policy expert by any means. I don't want to fancy myself as one or position myself as one, but I, I do think the the Fed sort of put themselves in a little bit of a corner here because I don't think people understood so much how shelter works in the CPI. And so, let me just briefly describe that for those who've not seen those posts or those listening is that. Um, you hear about shelter and the, and the consumer price index, and shelter is about a third of the CPI. Shelter is comprised of primarily two things, which is what's called the owner's equivalent rent, which is theoretically a gauge of what homeowners are paying. And then number two, the rent of primary residence, which is theoretically what renters are paying. But a lot of people don't realize that even the owner's equivalent rent or, uh, metric, and there's some weirdness that goes into this, it, but it's primarily based on a survey of renters asking about their rent is doing. And so the biggest variable in the CPI's most important category, largest category, is is rent. And in the CPI's version of rent, it's what the industry would call the in-place rent roll. And so it's a lagged indicator of kind of the street rent, uh, what someone's paying today. And this is interesting. And this is important because it's the only part, only major part of the CPI that is not measuring the today street price. Meaning like if I go to the store and buy eggs, 
those grocery costs are going to be reflected in this month's CPI, like the actual prices today. And the shelter and the rent CPI, it's counting any lease that was that's still active, even if it was signed, you know, 12 months ago at a lower rate. So that means it's going to be slower to move. And so the problem that we're going to see here is that shelter CPI is still up quite significantly, but it's based on the fact that you still have a lot of older leases. You also had a lot of leases that were not brought up to market in these last 12 months because a lot of property managers didn't want to bring leases all the way up to market and they want to keep renters in place and felt like that increase was too much. And that probably could have been the right strategy in many cases. But as a result, what I'm really trying to point out here is that the, the rent is going to be a very slow moving ship in CPI. It's going to keep going down and down and down. But when it's weighted that much, it really means you're going to have to have some categories of CPI go flat to negative in order to bring headline CPI back to 2%. And so CPI is going to continue to cool, but it's it's uh, it's going to be really tough to get it debt back down to the Fed's target range uh, anytime soon. But the uh, every month we're signing more and more of these leases at the you know flat to lower rate, yep. and you know maybe we're 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 seeing positive rent growth in our portfolio on renewals, and then you know several of assets have uh, negative trade outs on new leases, yep. and you know but more you know fifty fifty percent of our our rent roll turns over on expiration on average, then you know is is that not Am I thinking about it wrong? Would, would that not kind of yeah. start hitting CPI come, you know, March, April, May, when we start seeing that really? Oh, it will. It will. But it's just it's just the, te- the time it takes for it to happen. So CPI rent is coming down. But uh, I'm trying to see if I have these numbers in front of me here. But it's it's um, it's just going to take a while to, you know, I think we're going to get those numbers by the time we get into the spring and summer. I think we are going to be a, norm- a, a more kind of normalish range. But getting all the way back down to two, as opposed to say three, I think is is going to be the real challenge there. So yeah, it's it's going to happen for the reasons exactly what you mentioned. But just the way that they measure CPI and also the fact that it's a rolling sample, so they're calling these households like every six months, so they're capturing in some cases late data as well. It's just not it's not going to happen as fast as uh, it's happening in real life. Got it, Paul. Well, some great information from. Uh... Jay Parsons over at RealPage. And again, the best way to get a hold of Jay, I think it really is to go to his LinkedIn account. So send him uh, just a, a heads up notice that you want to follow Jay over at RealPage. Mike, James, any final words or any questions before we say goodbye, Jay? No, I think uh, I think Jay uh, appreciate appreciate your time, and I think uh, it's, it's gratifying for me that you know, I mean, my current investment thesis uh, is kind of in the meat of what you're saying, which is basically, I think today you could buy new construction 20-ish percent below current replacement costs, you know, the deals that started in 22, uh, which were the elevated cost. And, uh, and you know, I just look forward to second half of 2025, there's going to be a giant yeah. hole in new supply, new deliveries for a you know, better part of 24 months, likely. So, you know, kind of mid 25 through probably most of 27 and uh, we should see outside rental rate grow. So, you know, it's a slow, dumb business that, that we're in. Nothing goes super, super fast. And these investments are illiquid. So they, they take a little bit of time. But I mean, we're in uh, 2024 in less than a month as we record this now. So, I mean, uh, you know, 25 will be here before you know it. So I think that's uh, that's really kind of gratifying to hear that that's probably um, should be well. And then, you know, these newer, nicer construction deals are what, the larger equity groups are going to want to buy. They're not going to want to buy a deal in Greenspoint down in Houston built in 1970s. Yeah. They're going to want to buy a big, pretty deal in Plano or something like that, right? And that's what they're going to want to buy. So that, that that's gratifying. And, and you know, I, I've been saying, you probably don't know this, but I've been saying for years, it made no damn sense when, you know, we started doing older workforce housing stuff. We started our career and then, you know, we were buying those at eight, eight and a half caps and we sold them when they got to six, didn't know they're going to go to four. Otherwise it would have hung on yeah. a, little, a little later. We took that opportunity to buy the same or similar cap rate for something nicer or newer. So it feels like as cap rates are expanding, they're a little stickier on the top of the grade and then blowing out on the, on the bottom of the grade. And, and there's, yep. there, there is a risk between the grades and that should be priced in with a higher cap rate for the older stuff. So that just seems like um, you're just reinforcing what I've been saying for years. So, I, yeah, so you, you must be smart because you agree with me, I guess. Right. So yeah. <laughs> we are the smartest guys in the room. So don't forget on uh, January 17th, 18th, the DFW apartment investors group 
that's the field trip. Uh, again, we're, we're a founding member of that field trip, and DFW Apartment Investors want to see you just to get a great overview about what's going on. If you're a common equity limited partner that are thinking about putting some money into the DFW North Texas market, start to talk to some of the smartest guys on January 17th and 18th. Well, how do they sign up for that? That's going to be oldcapitalpodcast.com, oldcapitalpodcast.com. So try to get there and get your reservation there as quickly as possible. Smartest guys in the room, Mr. James Zhang, thank you very much for being on the, on the show. Michael Becker, this is your show. So thank you for being here now and not on another due diligence assignment. And of course, Jay Parsons with Real Pay. Certainly do appreciate you coming in. Again, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.